I am Kate Bovich, and I am your moderator. Um, I have been involved with trans and gender nonconforming media issues for a while. I have done a lot of work with Women Action and Media, which is a national feminist conference based in Boston. So that's a little bit about me. And the rest of the panelists are also going to introduce themselves. Good morning. My name is Gunnar Scott, and I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition. And uh, we're an organization that's uh, turning 10 years old this year. And we do work here in Massachusetts as well as uh, do some federal as well as state and local uh, work. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Carizzi. I am the former editor of Bay Windows Newspaper, which is a local LGBT weekly that covers Boston and New England. I was there for nine years as a reporter and an editor, and I'm now the manager of public education at Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders, better known as GLAD, an organization that works to um, eradicate discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, and HIV status in the six New England states. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Miriam Soyla Perez. I'm an editor at Feministing.com, a feminist blog, and I'm also um, a freelance journalist. Um, so, um, why we're here. So, Beyond Pronouns was kind of put together as a reaction to how media portrays transgender and gender nonconforming people um, and issues, and a lot of it is pretty horrific. Most of the coverage is um, uh, usually about somebody's death, often a trans woman of color. They're often in these articles mispronounced, misnamed, um, described in ways that are not necessarily how they lived, and um, yeah. Um, media also beyond that focuses a lot on um, physical transition and what um, and sensationalizes people's involvement with their bodies, um, creating kind of the media equivalent of gawking um, in a way that is in crossing boundaries and um, not focusing on the people, but like on a, on a process that really is none of their business. Um, often also there's a failure to um, represent photo uh, represent um, individuals who identify as gender nonconforming. Um, uh, often people can be eradicated, especially because if, um, especially when they choose to not use um, traditional male or female pronouns. There's currently a, a fight going on with Extra, which is in um, a paper in Canada um, by a contributor who wanted to be referred to as they, and the paper outright refused that they could be referred to as such. Um, we're going to discuss today um, the real stories of trans people and gender nonconforming people beyond, you know, beyond, you know, uh, beyond medical transition, beyond stories of death and dying, beyond stories of violence, because people are living everyday lives and people are living and they're, you know, um, working to survive and some are being accepted by their communities and. Um, we need that information out in the world to support each other. We're also going to um, give some good and bad representations of media. Um, and there are um, a few handouts on um, terms and journalist um, resources. Um, I'd just like to talk a little bit about gender. Um, I feel like one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that everybody has a gender regardless of whether you think about it or not. Um, if you are a person in the world um, 
you have a gender and as a journalist or as a media maker, um, you can help people understand that, or you can help create a world where gender isn't restricted into a binary or that isn't restricted to a conversation that has an expected narrative and an expected, um, an expected outcome that is open for people who have different experiences, have different histories, have different identities. We can make gender a conversation that um, isn't about one or the other, but is about people and how they live and um, isn't a, a status quo conversation that deals only in generalities and, you know, like ridiculous policing. So. Uh, that is my little bit about gender. Um, I think that I am going to pass along to Gunnar, who is going to give uh, a little Trans 101 and some more stories about uh, real people. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How is everybody? Excellent. So um, my, my task on this panel is to talk a little bit about who are transgender people, what are some of the terminology. We do have handouts that have some, has this information on it as well as our website and there's materials about that as well. And I'm also going to show a video from a project we're working on which is called I Am Trans People Speak. Um, we started embarking on a public education campaign here in Massachusetts because we're working on a the statewide law to add gender identity and gender expression to our state's non-discrimination laws. And there's several other states doing that. And one of the things that we kept coming up against was that people don't know who transgender people are. Um, that as Kate talked a little bit about, the media representation is pretty, I would say, biased to people's, what people's bodies look like. And, and assigning a, a gender based on that, on the body as, as opposed to how somebody lived their lives. Um, and we've seen this over and over again here in Massachusetts and also in other media stories. Um, so with that said, I just want to start with just, you know, trying to bring everybody onto the same page. The way I think about doing trainings and workshops is that we all come in at a different place on our own learning curve and we're all going to leave on a different place and that's the expectations today. My organization has been around for 10 years now and we're a statewide group that is uh, dedicated to ending discrimination on the basis of gender identity and gender expression. We're an advocacy policy organization. Um, and we work with folks who are experiencing discrimination at the time, violence, and things like that. And we're currently working through this bill, and I work a lot with Laura, on placing uh, media pieces about our community and the experiences that they're having. And as uh, Kate started opening up, you know, one of the questions I often get when I do trainings or talk about the community is people want to know, you know, well, how does a trans person know that they're trans? And I like to flip that around and say, well, how do you know what your gender is? And um, when I do uh, really concrete skills building trainings with folks, I actually have people break up into groups and, and talk about that. How do you know what your gender is? And many people who will say, I just know. And it's the same thing for transgender people. We know what our gender is, and it's not, we're not confused, although that's often the stereotype put onto us. It's really that the folks around us can be confused. Uh, because we're not matching up with those stereotypes of what a man is or what a woman is, um, or the cues are being thrown off in some way. Um, whether that's, you know, for me, I know when I answer the phone that my voice doesn't sound a t like a typical male's phone, uh, voice, and so the person often uses Miss for me, even though my name is Gunnar Scott. So they must, I can only imagine what they're thinking about my mother and what she named me. Um, so, you know, things like that will happen for folks or, oh, wow, that's a very tall woman. Because in this culture, it's very unusual to have tall women. Although there are lots of women who are tall who aren't transgender. So before we even get started, um, one thing I think sometimes gets confused for folks who aren't familiar with the GLBT community or the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community because the letters are all kind of put together is, so aren't trans people just like gay people? or vice versa, you know, sometimes we hear that. Um, the reality is for people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, and heterosexual, is that folks have what we call sexual orientation. We all have sexual orientation. Who somebody is attracted to? I call it the person who gives you butterflies type of thing. What's that thing, that person, that when you see them, you're like, ooh, I like them. Um, and that transgender people also have sexual orientation, but it is separate from gender identity. So gender itself is those culturally kind of defined codes of acceptable presentation, behavior, social roles, 
based on what men are supposed to look like and women are supposed to look like. And they're definitely, you know, they're not the same. You know, I travel throughout the country and throughout the world, and what men look like here in the North, Northeast versus in the Midwest is a little bit different. What women, how they present themselves in the South is different than how they present themselves in the Northeast. Um, I just came back from Texas from visiting my mom, and we had a little birthday party for her, and all the ladies at her party were doing the big hair, the big makeup, the big everything, you know? And that's not necessarily what you might see in other parts of the country, as well as with other ethnic communities, uh, religious communities, and so there's different kind of codes of behavior, and sometimes those also get confused. We had a case here in Massachusetts a few years back um, with two young girls who were holding hands on the train, um, and that they were... Um, they had homophobic slurs shouted at them. And these girls were not identifying as lesbian or bisexual. They were straight girls, and in their culture, it was young girls hold hands. That's how they express their friendship. And so that got kind of turned around for these people. And in the paper, it also got turned around. They started putting these labels onto them as well, instead of asking, how, how do you identify? And I think people are afraid to ask that question, how do you identify? Because there's an assumption about well, you look this way, so you must be this kind of person. So um, there are 13 states and about 142 city ordinances now that have uh, either gender identity or gender identity expression protections. Um, and here, you know, one of the common ones we're seeing post, I say, 2005 is a gender-related identity, appearance, expression, or behavior of an individual, regardless of that individual's assigned sex at birth. So that's really saying that people get to identify and present that gender identity they see themselves as. So gender identity, we all have that. It's how we identify our own gender. Um, some of us are more conscious than others. Some of us think about it a lot. Uh, I go to transgender specific conferences and that's what we spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about and theorizing about. Uh, and for other folks, it might just be like, you know, this is what I was raised as, this is how I identify, and you know, I don't really think about it beyond like, what am I gonna wear today? Um, gender expression is how someone expresses their gender identity. We all do this. It's also the cues that people use to identify someone's gender. And typically what I say is that when you're walking down the street and someone's walking towards you, usually the first thing we're trying to figure out about that person is what is their gender? Because that's gonna determine for us how we're gonna act or not act. Women are socialized in one particular way to act a certain way around people who they assume to be men and vice versa. Um, and as somebody who's transitioned from female to male, I very much see this. I very much see how I have gained male privilege in some ways versus how I, what I didn't get as when I was living and presenting as female. Um, you know, if I go into a store and there's a woman in front of me and it's a male clerk, oftentimes that male clerk will call on me first even though she's in front of me. Trans people, we get to see sexism alive and well and in ways that many people may not. Um, <laughs> it's, very, it's been very interesting to see that kind of culture, uh, unfortunately, that's still in our society. And then we have folks whose gender expression does not conform to those traditional stereotypes of what men or women should act or look like. And these folks may not identify as transgender. They may not even identify as gender nonconforming. They may be doing it just because for entertainment purposes. Uh, you know, I think about, I grew up in the 80s. How many folks went to high school in the 80s? It's all right, raise your hand, be proud. <laughs> Do you remember the hair bands, Cinderella? You know, those boys wore more makeup than I did in high school. You know, and so people play with gender a lot of times for, you know, for expression. Um, I work with a lot of young people, and young people really push boundaries with the way they express their gender. That's often the first way that they rebel against what their parents want them to do. So transgender is a term um, that is for people who live as the opposite sex from what they were born as. For some, it's, a, it's also considered an umbrella term to cover a lot of different folks. For many transgender people, at some point in their lives, they decide to live as the gender they see and identify as and transition to that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the term that transgendered with the ED on the end, I would say as a media person or a blogger or someone, we don't, in the community, we don't use the term transgendered. Like, we wouldn't say someone's gayed. Um, <laughs> we're not past tensed. Um, Although I will say there are some folks, in, we saw this very prevalent in the 70s and 80s, and it's, it's moved out of fashion now at this point. There are some older folks in our community that still say that for themselves, but um, when we're talking about like what are common use words in the community now, transgender would be it. 
Now, five years from now, I may come back and do this workshop and tell you something different. Language is changing in the community, and um, I'm a part of the international trans community, and, and we just did a conference last year, and we came to the decision that, that transgender didn't work for the international trans community, and we shortened it to trans. Because in some, some languages, there is no word for transgender. Um, and we, so we shortened it to trans, and then we had a, literally two pages of definitions of what that meant and who was included under it. The community was, was, had language put onto it, and so we're in the process of figuring out what is that language for us. Um, and some of the words that we also hear are genderqueer, um, gender not conforming, and things like that. So there's language, language is really moving and shifting in the community. Transition is how, when somebody begins to live and identify as the gender they see themselves as. And often this, this is about social transition. Um, for some folks, this is really about changing your name, um, unless you have a gender neutral name and you don't have to do that. Or for some people, they may not legally change their name. There's a lot of reasons. A lot of times it's economic reasons, family reasons. Um, if someone has a past criminal record or history, they may not be able to change their name. We've had problems in states where the judges have, have basically denied people name changes because they're doing a gender change and they don't agree with that. Um, so what we always say is, is that you should let people identify as who they are. Um, one of the things we run up against, uh, particularly with incidences of violence, is that the cops show up, you know, the, the trans person who's been violated against, you know, they ask for their name, they ask for ID, the person gives them the name they use, but their ID doesn't match, and then the cop says to the reporter, oh, the person's name is so-and-so, which was on the legal ID, and so that's how the legal, the legal name gets in there. And what we always say is you really should be using the name for the person who has, how they identify and not, and not that legal name. Changing gender presentation, how someone presents their gender, and this can be a subtle shift, this can be what might, someone might consider a radical shift. Um, I work with a, with a transgender woman who runs a GLBT youth program. She's done it for 30 years. Um, and the, the anti-GLBT anti group always calls her a man in a dress. She's never worn a dress in her whole life. <laughs> she's always like, I wear pantsuits. Um, she's like, but they always put me in a dress. I've never worn one. You know, and so using things that are kind of really biased. Um, changing pronouns, so the pronouns someone uses for themselves. And some folks go through what we call medical transition, but that's not the end goal of all trans people, and that doesn't make someone trans based on having medical transition. So the process, um, the coming out process is somewhat similar to people coming out around sexual orientation. Um, but really, for, for some trans folks, they struggle with this coming out. Um, we have folks that uh, come out very young. We have folks that come out very old. We have folks that have come out and then, because of economic circumstances, have gone back what, in, what I would call into the closet. Um, but people come out at all different, different times in their lives. I work with families who have children as young as six or seven, um, with kids who are clearly saying, Mommy, I know you keep calling me a boy, but really I'm a girl. And not only am I a girl, but I'm a princess, damn it. You know, so we see, and Barbara Walters did a couple of stories about this. And then I have folks that come out at the age of 70 because they've retired, their partner has died, their kids are grown up, and they feel like, this is my life, and I can finally live it. Usually the last place that most people come out is in the workplace, and that is because of the fear of losing their job, because a lot of states don't have protections. And even if in states that do have protections, you know, unfortunately we still have employees that are biased. And then for some folks, they go into what we call post-transition. We have folks who may no longer use the word transgender to describe themselves, that they are now living as the gender they see themselves as, whether that's a woman or a man, and they may not come out or disclose. And people don't have to disclose. It's not, it's not, there's no law that says someone has to say they're transgender, um, much like other personal things about folks. <clears throat> so some terminology, male to female, M to F, uh, a transgender woman, someone who is born male and lives and identifies as female, uses female pronouns. I often will see in the media, when they're describing someone like this, they'll say transgender man. And that's inappropriate. Um, it's about the person and how they're living now. Um, and that can be very confusing for people reading an article to see transgender man and then describe somebody who is living and presenting as female. A transgender man is someone who is female to male, F to M lives and identifies as male, uses male pronouns. So many of us live, present, identify without medical transition. That does not make us trans, having to medically transition. There are some folks that do parts of medical transition, but that's not the focus of our lives. Uh, for some people, they do want to go through a full medical transition and feel that if they do not, they're, that they're not going to be able to live out their life the way they feel they must. Um, we don't see it as a choice for some folks. 
Um, what it really comes down to is what's the level that someone goes to, and it's really about people becoming comfortable in their bodies. Um, we all do that, regardless of being trans or not. We all do things to be comfortable in our bodies. We do. Some of us will lose weight, gain weight, grow our hair out. Some people um, will do certain things to be able to present as who they see themselves are. And it's the same thing for transgender people. And the other mis misconception or misnomer about fo folks who are transgender is that honestly, when we transition, it really allows us to live a more successful, well-adjusted life. Society may not be so thrilled with that and they put up a lot of barriers, but the inside of us is, you know, it's like a roller coaster for us. It's like we finally get to be who we are and then we come up against this, this world of discrimination and stigma. Um, but a lot of folks talk about, you know, I, I know a lot of folks who, who go through their transition and then the next thing I know, they're going to school, or they're getting a new job, or they're doing something, um, and they're like, well, I'm not, my brain isn't all being taken up with all this gender stuff. I can finally just live out my dreams and my goals and my hopes and things like that. So just as a, some notes about trans folks, um, some of us don't have IDs that match our gender presentation. Um, to change your, your identification on state, local, federal level, it's a different process for every single one. Um, so many of us walk around with mismatched IDs. Um, things are starting to change on both the state and federal level. Passports is a little bit easier now to, to be able to change your passport. Um, prior to that, we had a lot of folks that didn't reach the bar, and so they may have a local, like a state ID, but a passport that didn't match. Um, before the passport change happened last summer, I was coming back from Spain into the U.S. You know, and just coming through customs here in the U.S. is just a little bit scary. Um, it's like you're going into a dungeon, at least here at Logan. And um, I get up to the line, and I'm exhausted, and the, the, the customs agent is, you know, looking at my passport, and he looks at me, looks at the passport, and he's like, are you Gunnar Scott? And I was like, yes. And he goes, well, I don't understand why you have an F on your passport. And he goes, what do you do? And I said, I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition. He goes, oh, well, that explains it. Why don't you fix this? And I said, I can. Well, you need to. And I was like, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, and I was like, are you going to let me back into the country? Like, this is my concern. And he's just like, OK. And he got disgusted with me and just was like, waved me on. you know. And so I had to out myself to this customs agent. And we see this a lot. And that sets us up for discrimination. Um, asking people what name they use for themselves. I mean, I think that's a very simple one, but there are a lot of folks, you know, when people get really hung up on the names, and I would say is that there's lots of folks we know that have nicknames, and we just call them by that, and it, it doesn't become a big deal, and it should be the same thing for trans folks. Um, and addressing people with the pronouns that match their gender identity and presentation. Privacy of transgender people should be respected in the same way that non-transgender people get privacy. One of the pet peeves I have is people asking me about how, what my body looks like really invasive. I mean, I have people come up to me on the train, don't even know me, because they don't think I match what they think, and will say, have you, what kind of surgeries have you had? I'm like, I don't even know you. You can't ask me that question. Using respectful language. Um, we had an article here in, in, in Boston, at the Boston Herald, and they used the word tranny. Tranny is a very disres disrespectful word to be using. And then, is disclosing the person's tran being transgender pertinent to the story? Sometimes being trans is not pertinent to the story. You know, we had uh, somebody here who got into a, who crashed an MBA, MBTA plane, train and happened to be transgender. And his texting and being trans were not connected. He shouldn't have been texting. He crashed the train. They don't need to come out that he's trans. Being trans is not a crime. And that, you, sh you know, just because someone's transgender, it shouldn't be assumed that they're, they're also uh, prostituting or doing sex work. So I'm actually going to move forward just because we are out of, almost out of time. And I want to show this one video from our project. Um, it's called I Am Trans People Speak. This project is on our website, transpeoplespeak.org. So you can actually, we actually currently have 17 videos up today. Uh, right now, and we're actually going to be loading up three more this afternoon when I get back to my office. We put up three new videos every three weeks. Um, and so you can go on and watch any of the videos. And now we're going to, this morning, I'm going to show you Joanne's. We don't have folks under 18 right now because of... Uh, we would need parental consent. Um, we, are, we do have folks that are 18 to 24, um, and we, are, we ha currently have 40, 37 videos shot. We have 17 up. So um, project is going to wrap up in June unless we get further funding, and we would focus on other specific groups if we are able to get further funding. I'm Joanne Herman. I live in Boston. I'm a wife and a stepmom. I'm a financial accounting professional. I'm an author, and I'm a transgender woman.
So I was working at uh, a nonprofit where I, I didn't really know how they were going to react when I decided to transition. I told the executive director, and she was fabulous about it, uh, but she passed word to the chair of the board. And as director of finance, I needed to work directly with the chair of the board. As soon as he found out, he stopped talking to me. And you can't be director of finance and not talk to the chair of the board. That's just not going to work. And so I knew the handwriting was on the wall. I couldn't stay. So I went to another nonprofit where I had done some consulting work and I approached the person I'd done the work for. I knew that she had an opening. It was a step below what I had been doing, but I was really, uh, I, I really wanted to make sure that I came into my new gender employed. And so when I told her that I was interested in the position, she was ecstatic. But she uh, didn't, wasn't prepared for the next part, which was uh, when I told her that I was going to, that I wanted to start the job as Joanne. It took her about a minute, but then she asked a question which I'll never forget, which was, well, that shouldn't affect your ability to do the work, should it? But I was, I was amazed. I just thought that that was an incredibly enlightened uh, view of things. And so I said, well, I, I really want to, I want to talk to the uh, executive director and the de deputy director because I want to make sure that they're in line with what you're saying. And they were. And, and so I got hired and I started at this wonderful organization, new job, starting out as Joanne, working with an office of mostly women and being uh, wonderfully accepted. Initially when I transitioned, I planned to blend in, uh, to essentially live as just any other woman and, and pretty much hide my transgender status. And after about a year, I was just so much happier being Joanne. My life was just so much better that I really felt the need to, uh, to thank the people who'd helped me. And when I talked to them, they all said, don't thank me, pass it on. So I started to look for ways to pass it on. And one of the things that people kept telling me was, gee, until you explained this, Joanne, I didn't really understand this transgender stuff. And so I said, okay, maybe I'm good at explaining stuff. I'll, I'll try that. that. That'll be my way of, of passing it on. And so that led to just this past year that I actually published a book called Transgender Explained for Those Who Are Not, which is designed for that same audience, folks who are maybe being exposed to the subject for the first time and are wanting to know something about it, but maybe not the whole clinical explanation. So other than that story where I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to stay at that one particular job and I had to find another, uh, things have gone really, really well for me. In fact, they've gone better for me than they've gone for most trans people, and I feel really, really blessed about that and really, really lucky. But it's really an example of what happens when you are accepted and supported. And if other people were to experience that too, they'd be able to thrive the same way that I have. So Gunnar's going to set up a PowerPoint presentation that I've done because uh, what I'd like to talk about today and basically what I want to do is simply give you some practical tips and tools <laughs> to help make reporting on transgender issues more accurate and fair and also suggest ways to make your news coverage more inclusive of transgender people who are a part of the community that you serve. Um, in the past decade or so, there's been some great advances in transgender visibility in our society. Um, president Obama has appointed out trans people in his administration. He's the first president to do that. Um, our Congressman Barney Frank appointed the first out trans uh, congressional staffer. Um, we elected the first transgender trial court judge in California last year. Uh, there's been some great TV characters on Ugly Betty, All My Children, um, Degrassi, and the media has also increased its coverage of trans people. Um, Dr. Oz and NPR have done some great stories on trans youth, 
And just a couple months ago, the Associated Press covered the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell from the perspective of transgender veterans because trans people still aren't alert, allowed to serve openly in the military. Um, but I think overall, and I see this a lot in the work that I do now with trans people who are facing legal issues, is that the average person who picks up their community weekly, who's looking at their local, hyper-local site online, doesn't have a very informed understanding of transgender people and the challenges that they face um, in their daily lives. There's a lot of harassment and discrimination and, and serious violence, as you've heard um, Gunner talk about. Um, and some of that fear is also fanned by right-wing groups who oppose all legal rights and protections for um, LGBT people, I mean the whole community. So there's this lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge, so people are afraid, they're uncomfortable, and it gets fanned by, you know, right-wing people, and it does not help for creating understanding of trans people. So I think that the media has a very um, important responsibility whether or not it's an issue that you care about just to, you know, when you're reporting on these issues to cover them fairly and accurately. And that's just all about, you know, getting some knowledge. So I'm hoping to give you some tips and some resources for your own reporting. So with that said, I'm going to share seven tips to improve your reporting on transgender issues. Um, and this is adapted in part from a reporter and blogger named Amanda Hess. Um, she works in D.C. and I've been following a lot of her coverage of attempts to pass non-discrimination protections for trans folks in Maryland. So she's done some great coverage of this. Um, so the first is know your terminology. You've already heard a lot about terms and um, there are some great resources that I'm going to share with you later, but the trans community is very diverse and, you know, for instance, cross-dresser is a very specific term and shouldn't be used to describe someone who has transitioned to live full-time as the other sex or intends to. So it's really important to know the diversity of the community, to become familiar with that and hopefully get your terminology correct because I believe that's a big part of educating readers. And I think this is important. Approach police reports critically. A lot of times I know that's where reporters get their first news tips and information. You know, when police are investigating crimes, um, a lot of facts come quick and they're making on the ground observations and they don't always know their terminology. And they often misidentify victims without following up afterwards with more facts. They're not expected to, that's not their job. Um, so police also often release few details in the immediate aftermath of an incident. And that's how crimes get sensationalized. And that's how, you know, you see headlines like, you know, male victim wearing a wig and a dress. And sometimes that's in the police report. I think things like that are red flags. You know, if you're informed about the community, you know that trans folks are disproportionately affected by violent crime. So if you see something like that, you know, I know we all, as reporters, look at police logs and we run them in publications. Um, but I do think there needs to be a level of sensitivity to the communities um, who are victimized by hate crimes and trans people definitely fall into that category. So I think if you see police reports like that, maybe, you know, investigate a little further, don't run with it until you can find out some more information. Who was this person? You know, what was their life all about? I think it's just, I think it's really a matter of responsibility in most cases. Number three, check your emphasis. Why are you including a subject's gender identity in your story? And Gunnar talked about a case in Massachusetts that happened in 2009. Um, a young guy who was texting while he was doing his job driving a TE caused a serious accident. Um, and his transgender status was reported on that. 
Um, but did it relate to what he did? I mean, that's a question that you really need to ask. You know, how does someone's trans identity matter in a story? Um, and is there a compelling reason that you're going to print that beyond sensationalism? Obviously, it's unusual and you can make that case, but I think if it doesn't, you know, directly affect the story, then you really need to think about, you know, whether there's a good reason to disclose that. So number four, don't focus on surgery. I think Gunnar has kind of did that. It's private medical information. I think you just need to be sensitive as you would to your other subjects who are dealing with medical issues. Um, I mean, it might come up in a story, a person that you're interviewing might bring it up, but I think, you know, you really need to make some carefully considered decisions about how much of that you would want to get into in your story. Um, transition isn't a one-step process defined by surgery. Not everyone has it. And there are many other angles of the transgender experience yet to be explored that are newsworthy. You know, it's really a long and complex process and people go through a lot of emotional changes as well um, and they find a lot of peace and that's not an angle that's explored a lot in the media. So number five, focus on the facts. Um, I think this particularly applies if you're reporting on political developments like non-discrimination laws. And across the country, folks who oppose non-discrimination laws for trans people have prevented, prevented their passage by arguing that they'll allow predators easy access to public bathrooms and women will be unsafe. Um, we call it the bathroom panic. And, you know, in all, it, I'll just stick with the LGBT community. I mean, back in the 70s and 80s, opponents of equal protections for gay people used the ar arguments about, you know, gay people are predators and they're coming for your kids and they're not good parents. Um, and they turned out to be not true, obviously. And I think that's a real issue when you're reporting on these political developments, you know, for example, with this bathroom panic argument that we do see across the country. How many reported incidents of this actually happening in the 13 states and 100 plus jurisdictions with these laws? None. You know, I think reporters have a responsibility to ask folks who are making these claims to substantiate them. I think reporters can investigate those claims independently um, to verify them, just as I think you would be expected to investigate a trans person's claims of discrimination. I mean, obviously, we may be coming at this from a biased perspective, I admit that. But I do think as if you're reporting on this issue, um, like any issue, you kind of need to look at both sides and, and help readers discern the truth. So um, obviously no claims from any one camp should, should go uninvestigated. Number six, know your history. And I think this is really helpful to, you know, informing, um, crime reports and political developments. The trans community is highly persecuted. Statistics show high rates of murder and other violent crime and harassment and discrimination. So I think perpetuating the myths and stereotypes and misinformation in the media can encourage and justify that persecution. Um, so I think when you're writing about these issues, you know, you really need to think about the history of violence against the trans community and irresponsible reporting, inaccurate reporting can really fan those flames. It, it can be dangerous for folks out there. And last, number seven, try to be inclusive in your community coverage. As you heard from Joanne, trans people are, you know, bookkeepers and wives, mothers. Trans people are parents, spouses, athletes, veterans, active members of their communities and PTAs and everything, little league coaches. So if you've got to write that story again every year like you do on Mother's Day or Valentine's Day, 
you know, find trans folks in your community. They celebrate holidays. They have stories to share. You know, it's a way to put a fresh angle on a story that you may be getting tired of writing. Um, and also kind of, you know, shows the diversity of the communities that you're reporting on. It helps educate people in the process um, or just, you know, gives a different take on a tried and true holiday. So I think those are it for my tips. But there are resources. There's a lot of great resources out there. National L um, Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association is a great organization. They've put out uh, style guides, um, resources just to help you get the terminology straight. They also include uh, AP style and New York Times style um, to help you know guide your reporting as far as pronoun use and other terminology. Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation has also done a great um, media resource guide which gives more story ideas for covering trans folks. Um, they also have a very detailed style guide that can help you get the terms right and help you navigate um, definitions and, and stuff that can be confusing. You know, when you're working on the fly, when you've got a deadline, there are definitely down and dirty resource gu guides that can help you. Um, Society for Professional Journalists has created the Rainbow Sourcebook, which is a database of um, expert sources who can talk about a variety of issues, including trans issues. And my last resource slide is just some organizations that can refer you to local and national folks if you want to find tr trans people in Massachusetts, if you want to find trans people wherever you're reporting from, if you want um, statistics and context and background research material, these are great organizations. Uh, National Center for Transgender Equality, uh, they do a whole host of stuff um, from congressional lobbying to media resources and everything in between. Transgender Law and Policy Institute uh, has a lot of legal resources to help you figure out um, laws in various states. Trans Youth Family Allies works with transgender youth. Um, they are a great resource if you're looking to cover trans youth. They do a lot of media outreach too. Um, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force does a lot of research. They recently released a study. Um, it's a first-of-a-kind study, a nationwide study on discrimination against trans people called Injustice at Every Turn. So, I mean, that's the first national snapshot of what's going on in the trans community. So it's, that's a great resource as well. And that's about all I have. Um, so like I said at the beginning, I'm Miriam Soyla Perez. I'm an editor at uh, feministing.com, which is a feminist blog. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of um, writing about trans and gender nonconforming issues um, from a blogger's perspective. How many folks in here are bloggers? Awesome. How many folks are journalists, traditional journalists? A couple. Okay, cool. So I mean, the, the lines are really blurry, right? Like you can be a blogger writing for the Washington Post. Like the, I think the rules are starting to um, to really meld with one another, but I do think that as a blogger, you, there are different issues that um, that come up when you're talking about writing about and reporting on trans and gender nonconforming issues. So you know, my sort of blog world is the feminist blog community, and we've um, there's been a lot of work I think done over the last few years to try to improve the coverage of trans and gender nonconforming issues within the feminist blog community. You know, we have this sort of feminist um, sort of perspective and label. Um, but we write about a whole host of issues across um, the political spectrum, across the social justice spectrum. And as a sort of a feminist community, in some ways, you know, a women's community, I think we've really struggled a lot with how to um, cover um, issues of gender from a perspective that includes folks across the gender spectrum. I personally identify as genderqueer, so I'm very invested in these kind of conversations with the feminist community about how we can really write about and, um, and address folks in our community who might not identify um, traditionally with the identity of woman or might identify as trans women and the struggles in the feminist community historically in, in integrating those folks. Yes? Uh, 
Um, I mean, that's challenging, right? Like, there's so many different aspects of the feminist community. I mean, I'm specifically talking about feminist blogs and, like, feminist, um, I mean, oh, well, like, feministing.com is a feminist blog, the one that I'm an editor of. There's also um, a, a big feminist blog called Feminist. Um, there's lots of smaller feminist blogs. Most of the, the folks in the blog community who identify as feminist are younger feminists, you know, so, like, 20-something, 30-something feminists. Um, it's tough because it's not a monolith, right, and it's not a unified force. So I sort of speak in general terms, but um, no, no, I no. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, all it means really is that people are using the label feminist to describe their work and their blogging. And there's, you know, there's sort of a community of people who are like, I'm a feminist blogger, and they they get to say that, and it means different things to different people. So it's it's a challenging term, I know, but um, but all that to say, you know, that it's a it's a, a community that tries to focus on gender in that feminism is, you know, a, a sort of political movement that is focused on the idea of gender and has struggled a lot with how to include um, folks across the gender spectrum and how they identify. So, you know, that's been a piece of my, is my expertise and my experience as a blogger. Um, so, I mean, some of the things I think that come up when you're a blogger writing about um, trans and gender conforming folks and experiences are very similar to the things that we've heard. Um, but one of the things that's different is that we often, as bloggers, rely on the traditional media um, for our content, right? So if I'm going to write about, um, for example, you know, um, an act of violence that happened to a trans person, the things that I'm relying on are the things that she's talking about, right? The reporting that's been done by the mainstream media. And often we see, and we're going to go through some case studies in a minute, of um, how badly those, those mainstream sources do when, they, when they're talking about reporting about trans people. So it can be challenging as a blogger um, who isn't going to necessarily look at the police report or go, to the, go do like original reporting and call people up and interview people, right? Um, although some people who blog do do that kind of original reporting. Um, so you have to rely on these sort of traditional media sources for your information. And oftentimes they're, they're getting things wrong, they're mispronouncing people, they're using offensive terminology, but you don't necessarily know, right? All you have is like, oh, this is what the New York Times says, or this is what the Boston Herald said, um, and they have con contradicting reports about who this person is. What am I going to say in my coverage of this incident that happened or this experience or, or whatever? And so that's one of the challenges, I think, um, when we're talking about blogging. And I think, you know, the, the, the advice to approach things critically is really important. To ask those questions of yourself, like, well, this is how this media source is framing it. What do I think's going on? I remember um, within the last year, there was a, a Puerto Rican person um, who was murdered in Puerto Rico. And there was a question about their gender identity and their sexual orientation and what the relationship was. And I really struggled with writing about this person because I didn't want to make assumptions that they were trans, that they didn't identify that way, or that they um, you know, were gay if they were, didn't identify that way. And this person, um, you know, I couldn't ask this person, right? This person had passed away in this incident. And so as a blogger, I think it's even more challenging because we're often writing about things really quickly. We're writing about things um, and we're relying on the mainstream media sources. So we have to ask the same questions. And, and oftentimes when I, when I write about these things, I just put those questions in the blog posts. And I say, you know, this is what this person said. This is what that person said. We need to take this with a critical eye because we don't know how this person identified. You know, their parents say this, but that doesn't mean that that's how they, they felt about their lives, those kinds of things. So in some ways, being a blogger gives you a little bit of room that you don't have to just pretend to be reporting on the facts, right? You get to say, this is the issue. These are the questions I'm asking. So yeah. OK, OK. We'll, we'll have questions. I'm gonna, um, we're going to wrap up in about 10 minutes, and we'll have room for questions. So one, you know, one of the challenges about blogging, about, um, about being a blogger, from my experience, is that we're often writing about issues that are outside of our expertise. And this is true for reporters, too, especially newspaper reporters. But some, some journalists get to have a beat where they're like, this is my issue, and I'm an education journalist, and I follow this issue, and I know it really well. And as a blogger who writes for sort of a big picture um, you know, blog that covers lots of different issues, I'm often r writing about whatever is the news that day, even if it's not issue that I know about. And so that, I think, comes up a lot when writing about trans and gender nonconforming issues and people, um, that we're often covering it, covering it, and it's not our expertise. It's not something that we know well. And this has, you know, happened to, um, to us at Feministing a lot that we'll get in trouble um, because we do things wrong. You know, we, say, we, we write things in a way that's offensive, we use the wrong terminology, um, and we have to, we have to kind of continuously learn those lessons um, as folks who are, you know, not necessarily inside the trans community or sometimes are, are allies. So, you know, I think as bloggers we have to be careful that we don't cover just what we know, especially if we're writing from a broad perspective, um, but recognize that it is necessarily outside our expertise and that we have to rely on the experts and the people who know the best about these issues. So, 
you know, I rely a lot on um, folks who are blogging within the trans community to see, well, how did they talk about this issue? How did they report it? What issues are important to them? To try to um, elevate those voices and, and get that expertise into the writing that I have. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges about being a blogger and writing about trans and gender nonconforming issues is comments. How many people like have struggles with comments on their on their sites or their blogs? A couple people. Um, and it might depend on your site and whether you get a lot of comments, whether you care about comments, whether you let comments just sort of cesspool into you know nothingness or whatever. But um, I we've had a really big challenge with with dealing with comments, particularly on a lot of issues, but particularly on um, issues around writing about trans and gender nonconforming people. There's a lot of ignorance out there about these issues, about our communities, about about folks. Um, and people say a lot of ignorant things in comments, right? Um, and see, people also say things, people say things are hateful and offensive, but they also ask a lot of well-meaning but ignorant and offensive questions. And we've, you know, I personally wrote a post um, a couple of years ago about sort of the bathroom panic thing, um, about focus on the family. And that comment thread um, just so quickly devolved in this horrific, horrific offensive conversation about trans folks and bathrooms and women's safety and it was it was really really challenging I didn't know how to moderate it I didn't know how to get involved I didn't know what was you know what was okay to go through and what was not okay um, and at the time we weren't really actively moderating our comments we were sort of letting it happen and then going in and, and moderating after the fact and um, and I got a lot of um, criticism from folks in the trans blog community for how that comment thread went down um, because we didn't moderate effectively because we let things go through that were offensive and so it's one of the big challenges I think because there's so much education that still needs to happen in the broader public and that we have these online forums um, even within a, a supposedly sort of like a you know in this feminist framework where maybe you think people have a certain political, shared political views, not just like a, a general newspaper. Um, we still have a lot of challenges about how to have those conversations. So I don't have a lot of solutions for that, unfortunately. It's just something that I think a lot about and we think a lot about in terms of how we moderate our comments, what kind of conversations we have, um, what things we allow, you know, how often do we go back and, and go to the sort of, you know, what Gunnar did, that sort of trans 101 and reiterate over and over and over again kind of our perspective. Um, what we believe, the fundamental sort of shared values that we believe that, you know, everybody gets to, to self-identify in terms of gender and that we don't get to question that, those kinds of things. So those are some of the struggles. Um, you know, one of the things I think bloggers have the opportunity to do that maybe journalists don't is that we get to, to rely and to share kind of our space with others who have expertise. So, you know, I write for a blog with 13 different contributors. So it's been important to us to have bloggers who have trans experience so that they can write about that, so that they can be part of the diversity of the blog and they can write about that if they want. Um, so it's, you know, it's about sort of diversity of perspectives without being tokenism. So, you know, we have a trans woman blogger, but we don't rely on her to write about every trans issue that comes up, right? We don't say, oh, you know, someone got murdered, like, your turn to write about this. Like, you know, we all take the, we all take the responsibility to write about these issues um, and uh, lots of issues across the, the political spectrum and outside of our expertise. But it's really important for us to have a diversity of perspectives, and that includes trans perspectives. So, you know, the only things I would say, you know, in terms of tips that I've mentioned, you know, rely on the experts when you're writing about these issues. Do, dig a little bit farther than the New York Times or the first article you find about, um, about an incident about a person um, to see, you know, what other people are saying about it, to see if you can find, um, you know, comments from people who knew the person so you can try to report about it um, with a little bit more sensitivity. And don't forget the 101, you know, don't forget um, reiterating sort of these, these basic things about folks and their experiences and, um, and, you know, the terminology that you're using because you never know sort of who's going to come to your issue and who's going to come to your blog and where, what, what expertise they have. So even just having a very basic 101 post and then going back to it, linking to it every time you write about an issue so people can go back if they don't know what you're talking about and see sort of the basics um, of that issue. And then, you know, having shared agreements between writers and readers, which sometimes can happen in comment policies, can sometimes happen um, through blog posts that you write about sort of the shared agreements of the site. Um, you know, one of the big ones, I think, for gender identity is just this principle that we allow people to self-determine how they identify gender-wise, and we don't have a right to question that, regardless of, you know, what's on their legal ID or, or how they were assigned at birth or whatever, that how people identify is, how they, is who they are, and that's, that's not our place to question. Um, and then in terms of comments, you know, don't be afraid to, to shut off comments <laughs> sometimes. Um, sometimes these conversations just get out of hand and, and the best thing to do is just to shut it down at that point and to start over, you know, with a different conversation. Um, that we have this idea that, you know, 
blogs are supposed to be this sort of like utopian free space that everyone gets to talk and everyone gets to dialogue and and no one and you know it's censorship to moderate people but these are our these are our spaces that we've created in particular ways with particular rules and um and we get to say you know this is not okay here and if you want to have this conversation you can go elsewhere but that conversation isn't okay to have here um so we're going to go into just talking a little bit about some case studies. So I'm going to hand these around. Everyone just take one. It's a double-sided page. Um, we wanted just to give some examples of good and bad um, ways of reporting on, um, on trans folks. And this is, you know, this artic these articles bring up a lot of the same issues that we've been talking about and a lot of the, the problems and the tips. We're going to really briefly talk about, about them, about these. So there's two articles on s case study side one and two on case study side two and they're all about the same incident um, so this is all reporting and thanks to Gunnar for for putting this together all right so let's start on case study side one where there's two different stories one from WREG Memphis and one from um, today's THV um, so can people just sort of from scanning the first side of the page tell me um, if you see some things that are red flags for you and how these, these two stories were reported about this incident. You want to just raise your hand and... Man dressed as woman. Right. So what is that? What, why does that draw your attention? Right. She said, we don't know how the person self-identifies. Other red flags, yeah, in the back. <laughs> it, it also takes away from the statistics or the reporting of incidents against trans, transgender persons right in terms of the level of violence so. those kinds of descriptors yeah, yeah. what else um, people notice um, it's just a red flag for me is that uh, the sentence uh, she caused no trouble and was liked as though transgender people caused trouble and it really just seems to discriminate and alienate Right, so, so um, this person said that, that the sentence caused no trouble and was liked sort of calls attention because it's, you know, why would we assume that she was causing trouble and wasn't liked? Um, other things that people notice? Yes? Well, I mean, the first headline is just sensational in nature. It's, you know, like that five second, uh, oh. Hold it. Okay. It's sensational in nature. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like one of those, like, five o'clock news, a man dresses woman, shot and dragged, find out more. Right. Um, whereas the other one, um, the person's uh, trans status is just another detail of their life. That's not really uh, the main point of the story. Right. You mean on the back? Uh, on what? Or the, you mean the case, case study? study one? Oh, on case study one. Okay. I'm sorry. Am I The second about? story, yeah. Okay. That's what I meant. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So, you know, the things to, to look out for, right, the things that are red flags, um, descriptors like man dresses woman, pronouns I think are an important thing to notice. And, you know, we, we call this session beyond pronouns because that's, that's not where we stop, right? But it is important to note um, how the stories do pronouns, what pronouns they use for folks. Um, the second story, you know, the first story is sort of like worst case scenario, I think, for us. The second story is like a little bit better. Um, and if you notice, they sort of switch pronouns in the middle once they refer to, um, they start talking to the friend of the person um, who you know, was murdered, and then all of a sudden they start using she and her because that's what the friend uses. So um, you know, that's confusing. I mean, I think it's better than sort of what they did in the first one, but it's also confusing because the reader comes away being like, I don't understand you know, how to refer to this person and what they're called. Um, so do you guys want to add anything? So let's flip over to, to case study side two which is sort of the better case scenario. Oh, yes, sorry, missed you. Um, on, on this um, first side here in the second story, this uh, victim was well known as a, quote, cross-dresser. Right, right. And what language are they using to, and why is that in quotations, and why do they choose that language? Um, is that how she, she actually identified? And some people do identify as cross-dressers, and that could be the legitimate way in which to identify them, but that doesn't seem clear from, from this. So this, this is a case because they're quoting the sheriff. And the sheriff, if you look, I looked at the story through, I think I was 50 different news stories. The sheriff in all of them is consistently biased. <laughs> and again, like thinking about what Laura said with looking at the police reports with a critical eye. Thank you. Um, so case study side two. So that's also two different stories 
about the same incident, but done in a much better um, a better way. And I think you know, Gunnar picked these two um, because it's important to note, you know, what does it look like when you don't know a lot about a story, but you still want to mention that it happened and say that we're going to cover more. And that's sort of the first example that they don't know a lot, but they still did a good job of explaining. Um, the very bare minimum facts um, in a way that wasn't sensational or offensive to to the people involved, right? Um, so that's important to see that you can you can write just a sentence and still report about it ethically and effectively. And then the second story, um, just just want to chat out a few things that we think are are good about the way that story is written. I know it's long and people haven't read it, but things that jump out at you that are different than sort of side one. Well, they actually don't in the second one say man or woman. They say victim, and then they use her, she and her pronouns. But they don't. They just don't. They don't. They just make it a point not to have to say man or woman. Right. Right. And they, well, they say transgender woman in the title, right? But they, yeah, that's a good point. That you don't always have to to use those descriptors. Jacqueline Friedman <laughs> snuck in. Hi. It's particularly great at the end uh, how critical they are of the sheriff and especially love the line, it is unclear how he made the assumption that Ty was a prostitute. Right. Um, like, you know, use the sheriff's quote, but like put it in a context using their own reporting. Right. Right, being critical, right? That's exactly the point we've been making. Yeah. I think it was good that someone picked up on the fact of there is kind of a lack of, you know, gender identification in this story. And that is okay as a reporter. If, if you don't know when you can't get a hold of the person and you can't get confirmation of, of how they lived, what their gender identity is, I mean, it's okay to work around that. Um, it's better than guessing. Yeah, and that's definitely something I've done in blog posts too is, is avoided using those terminologies if I don't know. Um, and I can't figure out how they identified. So the only other thing I'd point out about this story um, that I think the, the last one does a good job is that it sort of points out the victim blaming that was going on in the first couple of ways of reporting this and in the sheriff's reporting of it, right? And this is something that we see not just for trans folks, but also we see a lot in reporting about sexual assault. Um, and there's been a ton of stuff in the media lately about a couple of really horrific gang rapes that have happened to like 11-year-old girls and how the media, even the New York Times, wrote about those, um, those stories, particularly wrote about what the girls were wearing, where they were, um, and that even just pointing that out, even just pointing out, you know, how this person was dressed, um, you know, where they were, um, what they might have been doing can inherently be a little bit of victim blaming. And so um, I think that's something that we really have to, to notice that it's, that no noticing what trans people are wearing or making sort of hints about, you know, prostitution or sex work in and of itself inherently is starting to say, well, this person was murdered because they were looking for sex work, or this person was murdered because they were trans. And it might, you know, this, this, this last one talks about, well, it might have been a hate crime. So sometimes it's important to talk about, well, this person may have been murdered because they were transgender, but l we gotta talk about it in a way that doesn't say, doesn't put the blame on them for that. And so that's, I think they did a really good job of, of noting that um, critically, so. Um, one thing that I want to comment what you just said was that I know that article about how they were talking about that 11 year old girl who was raped and instead of focusing on the crime and how instead of saying that she was a victim it was she was she was asking for it. so when they're focusing on when they're focusing more on their gender specific oh this is why it happened like you know and it's not focusing on that it's it's a problem that when um, hate crimes do happen and does happen in the gay community and it's not only just a racial thing. Like, so reading this one, when it, when it even asked the question, was it a hate crime? It brings it up that it's something that is, that it's not just about either it's a he or she thing. It's not focusing on, oh, she was a cross dresser or he was a cross dresser. It was focusing on that it was un, un, a murder that unjustly murdered this person. And that's what I, I actually like that you even made that comparison to that 11 year old girl when they were saying, oh, it was the way she was dressed. So she was asking right. for it to get gang raped. Right. So it was like reading this and like seeing the difference. Like I, I understand what you guys are talking about, yeah. how truthfully writing a story, like your, your job is to not criticize or like, you know, this person because of the, w the way they want to describe themselves and what their gender is or right. isn't. So, yeah. Yeah, good. And, you know, it's the New York Times doesn't have to say, or, you know, these articles don't have to say, like, this person was asking for it or this person deserved it to, to it contribute to that dialogue by putting those details out there in a particular way, you know. So you have a lot of power as journalists 
to influence the public conversation in ways that can be really, really horrifically negative. So it's really important. It's, it's not just, um, you know, what details do I describe or, oh, there was a wig that's important to include, but, but what, how can that information be used and what, um, what um, sort of assumptions can people take from that? And, and it's, it's important. It's ethically a big consideration, I think, for us as journalists. Um, in the back. So I was just noticing that the dates on all of these and how the better reporting comes um, a few days after the first reports. Yeah. And I was wondering if that's pretty common in what you see of the coverage where it's the journalists come out, offend people, and then the kind of more detailed response and the more kind of measured response comes later. Or if you know of any good blogs that kind of give that measured response early on so that way you're not starting with a biased foundation and then trying to overcorrect? Um, well, I'll just say that, that oftentimes we, what happens is, yeah, you're right, the first story is usually the most offensive one. And, and some, some organizations like mine, the minute, like I have a Google News thing, so I have transgender, I have a bunch of words. So I get all the news stories that happen around the country. And so for Massachusetts specific ones, when we start, we see, we actually just had a case like this, man, uh, man in a dress was violently attacked in Chelsea. Um, and so I sent, uh, we did a press release about the language that was being used and they actually took the link down and I forgot to copy the story, that was the one I was going to use. Um, but they took it down right away and then all of a sudden all the other pieces said transgender woman. Um, and what happened in that case was that the, the Chelsea police, the captain at least, did the right thing and was talking about the victim the right way. It was a patrol officer that outed her legal name and called her a man address, and that's what ended up in the news report. E and the captain was trying to do the right thing, and our Suffolk County DA's office actually put out a press release and didn't use any gender uh, because they didn't want to put that on her until they had it verified and they had met with her. Um, so our DA's office was trying to do the right thing, the captain was trying to do the right thing, and it was a, an unformed patrol officer who then fed that to the media, and the media, of course, sensationalized it. And we got the press release out, and I think was, was it six hours, and the link came down off that. Um, site and then the news stories sh shifted because of that. So that's the that's the piece that we're trying to work on as organizations is to really educate. And sometimes we have to do that with a little bit more of a what I would call a an iron fist and and use what I call the strongly worded letter to do so. I do think um, it's true that with with crimes against trans folks, especially murders, um, the stories do get progressively better. But I also think. Um, for journalists, it's, it's a cautionary thing, like, and points to the need to be educated, to recognize the red flags, you know, could this be a hate crime? And maybe take a step back and don't rush to the cameras and the press um, to run with that story right away, because, I mean, you also can hurt your own credibility if you've got to run three corrections afterwards which you know just recently happened I think in the Washington Post when a trans woman was murdered I mean I think as journalists no one likes to have to say oh sorry for that mistake um, it hurts your credibility as journalists so you really you know need to think critically about when you want to run a story and, and do you have enough facts and information or is this something that's more sensitive that maybe you should investigate a little further Hi, thank you for this great panel. Um, we've talked a lot about journalism representations, and I think that that's really important since this is free press, but I was just wondering in terms of quote unquote entertainment representations, um, like the show that's allegedly reality TV, America's Next Top Model, we have representations of Miss J where it, her gender is very much sort of unspoken. There isn't a lot of dialogue, and yet they also have a, had a contestant, um, Isis, who her gender was really explored in the context of the show and, and what you folks think about that. Well, I, I mean, I think I applaud that show because there is Miss J and, you know, maybe she doesn't want to talk or he doesn't want to, she goes back and forth with both pronouns. And, you know, that's about, here's somebody that may not want to talk about that. And I think in different industries, trans people, gender non-conforming people have been solidly there, but have always been kind of under the radar. Um, we, we have, our history has been erased, um, even from the Stonewall narrative. Um, transgender folks were a part of that early gay rights movement. We were part of a lot of organizations, did a lot of activism, and our history is completely erased from that. If you read books about Stonewall, 
the, oftentimes they're called, uh, trans folks are either called street queens or drag queens or cross-dressers, and that's not actually how those many people identified. I and mean, that was um, uh, some research that I had done, and there's a new movie call, coming out called Stonewall on PBS, and it's based on David Carter's book, and, the whole, and David Carter flatly says, oh, trans people weren't part of this movement. And Marsha, Marsha, um, Sylvia, I'm sorry, Sylvia Rivera was not part, was not there, Marsha P. Johnson wasn't there, and these are trans icons in our community, and they were, they were there. Um, and so, we, we, our history is often erased, we're often downplayed, um, and I do think the two reality shows, and then, um, the one with, uh, I want to work for P. Diddy, whose name, the woman is escaping at the moment, but, were actually a turning point because they were done quite well. And I actually went, when those shows were going on, I looked at the, the comments, and the comments from, for um, I went to the Next Top Model was not as good as I Want to Work for Diddy, the woman who was on there. And I don't know if it was, if it was just, um, just the way that comments were about the different models. And I mean, I think that's just a whole nother workshop about <laughs> beautification and, and the sexism there. So, um, and the real world has also had a trans, young trans girl on there. But again, I think the focus often always goes back to what kind of body do you have? And that for us, which is why we did our project, we want to get away from those stories about what is, what is the, sur you know, if you've had this kind of surgery, then you've reached this bar and you get to be called this. And that at the end of the day, that's not what it's about. You know, we live our lives in lots of different ways. And, the, you know, I know lots of trans people and I have no idea what their surgery status is and it's none of my business to know that. And I think it's the same thing in the media. Um, I think that Miss J is amazing. And as somebody who identifies as gender nonconforming, it is really awesome to have somebody on mainstream TV who isn't going to necessarily have a conversation about how they identify, but still exert or still... Um, exert their identity onto the world and you know kind of make people understand that it's okay like that I, I'm using these multiple pronouns and I'm appearing in different ways and like that's who I am and not necessarily having to have like a huge discussion about it like this is um, you know kind of hopefully a like a, a move forward to you know letting more people like that into our media and our homes. Um, this is for Miriam. Um, you said before um, that you define yourself as gender queer. Can you uh, um, elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that word probably has different meanings for lots of different people. Um, but I use the term to sort of reflect kind of just like a discomfort with the identity of woman that I was assigned at birth. So, I don't necessarily identify as male, um, but I just sort of, I use that term because it, for me, reflects this discomfort that is part of my life and sort of I play with that and it's constantly something that I grapple with, kind of this discomfort with, with the identity that I was assigned at birth, which is, you know, female. Um, and it affects how I present and how people see me and, um, and so that's how I use it. Different people use it differently. Um, in terms of how the, uh, the, the progressive independent media uh, covers trans issues, uh, and which has often been to kind of bundle them in with uh, uh, GLBTQ. Um, would you rather see a kind of a deliberate focus on, on those issues, or just uh, a kind of improvement in, in how appropriately uh, trans people are covered when, when they are involved in stories? I mean, I do, I do see as part of the GLB T, I'll call it, although I call it the small T community, um, because some of our struggles are the same. Some of us are also uh, gay, lesbian, or bi as well. I mean, I identify as a queer trans person, and oftentimes, I mean, with, with any of us, we only get to actually be one identity, because if we put out more than that, people are like, whoa, you're too much for me. Um, and so, like, I'm always the trans guy. So you don't get to, like, have multiple identities. So I do think one is improving coverage within talking about GLBT communities to include the T in that, but also separate coverage for our trans folks. I think, uh, again, the, the issue we were coming up against when we do legislative work or policy work is people don't know who trans people are. Um, and the few stories that are out there, I mean, this story in particular, I found it, I think, 60 times. When I just Google man in a dress, like every story on trans people comes up. And, you know, the, uh, and mostly they're murder victims or violence victims. And, um, you know, we wanted to show stories of our community members in you know, being who they are. And the reason our project is called I Am is because it's like we are multiple things. 
we have folks who are parents. We have folks that, you know, we have one woman who just lost over 100 pounds and became a marathon runner. And she lost the weight because she transitioned. And she was like, oh, I can, I've always wanted to be a marathon runner, but I was 400 pounds. And now I've, like, transitioned and I'm, like, feel good about it myself and I'm losing all this weight, you know. And we have um, parents on there talking about, you know, one dad who's a firefighter who talks about, you know, he would go into the firehouse and all his, the guys would talk about their kids. And the minute he started talking about his trans son, they'd get up and walk away. And, like, just how painful that was, you know, and just, like, the reality of us living our lives. And some of us are just totally boring. And, like, I totally get you don't want to cover someone who's boring, you know. And, but I will say what annoys me the most is when I get a call from a reporter and they're like, I want to talk to someone who um, hasn't had surgery yet but is a hate crime victim and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, listen, first of all, if they're a hate crime victim, they're probably not going to want to talk to you, like, especially if it's just happened. And, and because of the way people have been sensationalized, we would actually probably say to them, this probably isn't a good idea. Because you're, you're, what the other thing happens for us is that some of us are targeted. You know, as someone who is very public about being trans, I do get people coming up and threatening me. I do worry about when I'm in the paper, what, you know, what is my neighbor going to do to me? You know, I, you know, I find out because they write letters to their legislators and they forward them to me and then I'm like, wow, this person lives next door and they're against my bill. And they said all these awful things and now I'm going to keep my head down. And we've actually had activists that have been murdered. Um, and so there's also that concern in our community. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about with the, the, the trans woman in Chelsea who was, who was brutally beaten by, they put out not only her legal name, but they put out her address. And I was like, so you want to continue to have her targeted? And this was the mainstream paper. And so, yeah, like, was that important? Do you do that with all crime victims? Um, and so I guess, you know, we would love to see stories beyond people's surgery, beyond violence, and, in, and the ones that are covered around violence are covered, covered well um, and done well. And why aren't we exploring why that person did that? You know, why is it always focused on the victim? I mean, I see that with domestic violence, sexual assault, and I think this is the, when we talk about feminists, you know, I consider myself a feminist, and I think it's about thinking about sexism and how does that affect us. And for trans folks, it does affect us, and it affects us pretty deeply, particularly people who are going from male to female. And, and showing any sort of femininity is a negative thing. And that's what they're trying to eradicate, particularly with tra young trans women of color. It's eradicating that femininity, it's eradicating race, and it's like saying, you are nothing. Um, and, and that's what scare is scary to us. And it's scary, you know, when people find out someone's a female to male, it's like, oh, you are, f you are female, I'm gonna eradicate that. And it always comes back to that. I think about trans communities as past, present, future women, because the gender violence is so real and so concrete. Yeah. And I would you know, just add that I think for me also, it's really important to talk about kind of how the, the policing of gender impacts people outside of trans folks too, right? Because I think we sometimes we think that, oh, it's sort of like what Kate was saying at the beginning, like the only people with gender are trans people. It's like, no, we all have a gender identity and we all have um, experienced gender policing and we're all negatively impacted by gender stereotyping in different ways, right? But like, for example, oftentimes, um, you know, it, Examples of homophobia are very much rooted in gender oppression, right? Like Candace McMillan, you know, the reason they were upset at her was because she wanted to wear a tuxedo to prom, right? That's a gender issue. And she may not identify as trans, she may identify as a lesbian, but like, I think it's important for us to, foc to emphasize that, that that's, that's gender-based oppression um, that, that means that this issue is relevant to people across sort of the gender spectrum. Because I don't want us to feel, like I think it's really important to elevate the lives and experiences of trans people and how they're how they're treated and, and how that's different, but it's also not to sort of segregate that and say, well, gender only matters to people who are trans, you know, that we don't all experience that. And so that's a big piece of my project kind of in the, you know, progressive blog world too. Question over there? I just wanted to uh, see what you thought about um, LGBT uh, organizations and you talked about blogging because I go on your website a lot and it's really great. Thanks for all the work you do. But there's a lot of other stuff online and, and like in, in in alternative media, and it's all you know, gay and lesbian, you know, and and like you said, the small t. I work with a lot of, of uh, low income and uh, colored transgender folks in San Antonio, Texas, who um, are constantly trying to work uh, their own way of how to how to tell their stories because these larger organizations, even the larger mainstream LGBT, whatever I don't, that I, I get irate thinking about it, but. Um, and like the advocate and all these people, and there's never you know transgender stories issues, and and they're they're like the T should be first for me, uh, you know, 
it should be T L G B. You know, uh, um, because I it's second that. And, and it is. And, and one of uh, one of our, our youth L G uh, transgender uh, wrote a really great blog, and I'm going to forward it to yeah. you so that you can just read it and get it out because um, she's she's really young and she doesn't know how she's going to go about you know being a low income person of color transgendered young woman now um, and how she doesn't feel that there's a, a, a role in her. I just want your opinions on what you guys think about that. Well, I mean, I think it's a struggle with the larger national organizations and even um, the state equality groups. You know, we're an independent organization. I've had a lot of people say, why, didn't you, why don't you merge with mass equality? Why don't you merge with this LGB? Why do you have to have your own thing? And the reality is, is that 10 years ago and today, Trans issues are not put first in LGB organizations. They're a part of their, their agenda, but often they're the last thing. And oftentimes when the funding goes, so does that. Um, and so we wanted an organization that focused specifically on the needs of trans and gender nonconforming folks. Um, and the funny thing is, is because particularly here in Massachusetts, because we think we got it all done because we have marriage. Um, <laughs> So the organizations and the folks that did work around LGB issues have kind of either have consolidated or have gone away. And I mean, we get calls about violence issues that happen to gay and lesbian people because they're like, I don't know where else to call. And you guys are the most active and visible. And I'm like, well, that's really great. I'm, I'm really sorry that happened to you, but I'm a single staff organization and we can only focus on this. We end up doing it anyways. And I mean, the reality is, is that you know, the more be more gay and lesbian people come mainstream, the less of our culture is out there as a gay and lesbian person too, you know. And for trans folks, you know, I've come to the reality is that it's not, it's parallel organizing, it's a both and that we still need to be a part of the LGBT kind of movement, but we need to have our own movement, and we've had our own movement. People just don't recognize it. We've been, you know, I've been doing this work for over 10 years in a lot of different ways, and it's about doing both of those things. But I see our work more connected to issues around economic justice, around issues around race, around immigration. I mean, the identity document issues for trans folks who are born in the US, they affect us. The minute they start sending out no-match letters, I know because my folks are like, oh, I just got a gender no match letter at my job. And I know that that place has you know, decided that they're going to hang out with ICE and check all their employers against the database. And so we figure out a lot of that kind of stuff too. We are out of time, unfortunately. We do have a lot of resources up here at the table. Um, some of the stuff that Laura talked about. There's also cards about our project. Thank you so much for attending the workshop.